ever wished you could just hop on a plane and like trace history with your own two eyes? Well, today we're ditching those boring travel brochures and taking a deep dive into a scenic and historical flight path. Get ready, because we're flying from Rome to Corfu. Buckle up. And you know, it's not just about the destination. This route, we're talking layers of history, geology, and views. Oh man, these views, you can practically feel the breeze on your face. First stop, Rome, baby! Now you've seen the Colosseum, right? A million photos, I'm sure. But imagine this, looking down at it from above, like your back of the days of gladiators and emperors, can you imagine? It's one thing to read about the Colosseum. It was a marvel of engineering, sure. But picture this. It's Rome's heyday, this massive structure surrounded by a city of nearly a million people. That's when you grasp the sheer ambition of ancient Rome. And then, boom, I there's St. Peter's Basilica. I mean, that dome, iconic. But from above, just a glimpse, a hint of the artistry inside. Makes you want to land and explore, right? I might do. I hear you. <laughs> and just a quick hop east of those landmarks, you'd see the Roman Forum. Now today, it's mainly ruins, but from the air, you might just make out the outlines of temples, government buildings, the heart of a civilization, gone but not forgotten. Okay, so we're leaving Rome, but don't relax just yet. Get ready for a totally different kind of wow factor. We're flying over the Trinian Sea. And let me tell you, the Trinian Sea, this isn't just some ordinary body of water. It's a remarkably deep part of the Mediterranean. We're talking like over two miles deep in some areas. It's no wonder it's home to some of the most vibrant marine life on Earth. And nestled right along the coast, you'll spot Naples. But let's be real, your eyes would be glued to something else entirely. Am I right? I'm talking about Mount Vesuvius. You'd be right to look. Vesuvius, well, it's more than just a volcano. It's a stark, and I mean stark, reminder of the power hidden beneath our feet. Remember the 79 AD eruption that buried Pompeii? That plume of ash and rock shot 20 miles into the sky. A real tangible mark of nature's raw power, my friend, that you can still see on the landscape. And that's what I love about these deep dives. We're not just seeing, we're understanding. Okay, enough about volcanoes. Next up, the Calabrian coast. Calabria, often overlooked, you know. But this region, it's got culture. I mean, it's been called the toe of Italy's boot. And oh, yeah. it juts out into the sea, creating these dramatic cliffs and hidden coves. Seriously, stunning. Oh, and the food. Forget about it. I've heard it's unbelievable. Fresh seafood and spices they use. It makes oh. sense, though, being so close to Greece. Absolutely. The influences are a whole other deep dive. But visually, prepare for a shift as we cross into the Ionian Sea. You'll notice the water's color. It changes. It's true. It goes from this deep blue to like a jewel-toned turquoise. Uh -huh. Is that because it's shallower? What's the deal with that? It's partly the depth. The Ionian Sea is shallower on average. But there's more to it than that. Different mineral content, even the types of algae, all that affects how the light plays with the water. These subtle details, they create a completely different experience, trust me. And finally, this is it. We're approaching Corfu. I know what you're thinking. Love beaches, it. beaches, beaches. And yeah, Corfu's beaches are amazing. But there's another side to this island. You're spot on, the olive groves. And they're not just there for the picture-perfect postcards. They're a part of Corfu's history. They've been cultivating olives here for centuries. Some even say those olive trees are descendants of the very ones from ancient Greek myths. Isn't that something? See, this whole flight path, like flipping through a living, breathing history book. Couldn't have said it better myself. It's a reminder that sometimes the best journeys, they're less about the destination and more about the stories you discover along the way.
fasten your seat belts, but we encourage you to keep them fastened while seated. Signore e signori, potete slacciarvi le cinture di sicurezza. Tuttavia, vi preghiamo di tenerle sempre allacciate mentre siete seduti. Ladies and gentlemen, you may unfasten your seat belts, but we encourage you to keep them fastened while seated.
leaves that keep on melting Nothing real at all Dreams that feel like waking Nightmares feel like home I am just a stranger yet never seen Title, Beneath the Stone. The expedition had begun like any other, satellite scans, rough maps, and whispered rumors of an ancient city buried deep beneath the earth. Yet nothing could have prepared Dr. Elena Cole and her team for what they would find. After weeks of descending through twisting caverns, they finally broke through a massive stone dome. Behind it lay an underground city, vast and untouched by time. It sprawled beneath the earth, its towering structures carved directly into the stone. Glowing crystals embedded in the walls gave off a soft, eerie light, casting long shadows over the forgotten metropolis. Elena's breath caught as she stood on the edge of the platform overlooking the city. This is it, she whispered. The lost city of Ithralis. Her team stood in stunned silence. No one had believed the ancient texts that spoke of Ithralis a thriving underground civilization that had mysteriously vanished centuries ago. But here it was, hidden from the world, untouched by war or decay. And now, they were the first living beings to set foot in it. Look at the architecture, murmured Ben, her lead archaeologist, as he examined the stone carvings. It's like nothing we've ever seen before. Elena nodded, her mind racing. This discovery was going to change everything they knew about ancient civilizations. The language etched into the stone walls was foreign, yet oddly familiar. 
She ran her fingers across the intricate symbols, feeling the weight of history in her hands. Let's keep moving, Elena said, pulling herself back to reality. We need to document everything. As the team descended into the city, they found signs of a once thriving society, homes, temples, markets, all perfectly preserved. It was as though the inhabitants had simply vanished, leaving everything behind. Hours passed as they explored the ancient streets, their voices hushed in. But as they moved deeper into the heart of the city, something changed. The air grew heavy, almost oppressive. The crystalline lights, which had glowed softly throughout the city, began to pulse. Does anyone else feel that? asked Maya, the team's tech expert, her voice barely a whisper. Elena frowned. There was a strange hum in the air, a low, rhythmic sound that seemed to come from the ground itself. The deeper they ventured, the louder it became, resonating through the stone walls. Suddenly, a loud rumble echoed through the city. The ground beneath their feet trembled, sending dust and small stones raining down from above. The team froze. What the hell was that? Ben asked, his voice tight with fear. Before anyone could answer, the floor beneath them cracked open. Elena barely had time to shout before she and the others plummeted into the darkness below. When Elena came to, she found herself in a vast chamber, its ceiling soaring high above. Her team lay scattered around her, groaning in pain but alive. As she pushed herself up, her eyes widened in shock. At the center of the chamber stood a massive figure, carved from stone and metal, towering at least 20 feet tall. Its eyes glowed with the same pulsing light that illuminated the city. And it was moving. The ancient guardian turned its gaze toward them, and Elena's heart pounded in her chest. Creators, it spoke, its voice deep and resonant, vibrating through the air. You have returned. Elena's mind reeled. Creators, what is it talking about? The guardian stepped forward, its massive feet shaking the ground with each step. I am Ether, guardian of Ithralis. I have awaited your return for eons. Maya scrambled to her feet, backing away. What do we do? It's alive. Elena swallowed hard, trying to process the situation. The guardian seemed to believe they were its creators, ancient beings who had built this city and left it to slumber. Why, why do you think we're your creators? Elena asked, her voice shaking. The guardian tilted its head, its glowing eyes narrowing as it studied them. You were the marks of the creators, it said, gesturing to the symbols on the walls. You bear their knowledge. Elena glanced at the carvings, realizing that the symbols Ither referred to were similar to the ones they'd been studying in ancient ruins around the world. Could it be that the civilization of Idralis had somehow influenced human history, leaving behind fragments of their knowledge? We're explorers, Elena said carefully. We're here to learn about Ithralis. The Guardian's gaze softened. Ithralis was once a beacon of knowledge and power. But when the creators left, the city fell silent. I have kept watch, waiting for their return. Elena's pulse quickened. What happened to the people of Ithralis? The Guardian's eyes dimmed, as if in sorrow. The creators gave us life but their departure doomed us. Without their guidance, the city withered. The inhabitants were not meant to survive without the Creator's life. Elena felt a chill run down her spine. The people of Ithralis hadn't vanished, they had perished, abandoned by their creators. But who were these creators? And why had they left? As she struggled with the enormity of it all, Ither stepped closer, towering over them. Now that you have returned, Ithralis can rise once more. You will restore the city to its former glory. Elena's heart raced. This was no mere ancient artifact. Ither was a living remnant of a forgotten civilization, and it expected them to bring the city back to life. But how could they, mere humans, do that? We, we can't do that, Elena said, taking a step back. We're not who you think we are. The Guardian's eyes flared with sudden intensity. You must... The city cannot survive without you. 
The chamber trembled as the guardian's voice grew louder, more desperate. The glowing crystals embedded in the walls pulsed in time with its agitation. We need to leave, Ben muttered, panic creeping into his voice. But before anyone could move, Ether raised its massive arms, the ground beneath them rumbling. If you will not restore Ethralis, then you will remain here, forever. Elena's mind raced. There was no way out. They had awakened something ancient, something that believed in its creator's return. If they didn't act quickly, they would be trapped in this forgotten city for eternity. Taking a deep breath, Elena stepped forward. Wait, she called out. We'll help you. But we need time. We need to understand. The guardian hesitated, its glowing eyes flickering as it considered her words. You have time, it rumbled. But the city will not wait forever. Restore what was lost, or be consumed by the void. As the chamber fell silent, Elena turned to her team, her heart heavy with the weight of their discovery. The lost city of Ithralis was not just a relic of the past. It was a living entity, waiting to be reborn. And now, they were part of a legacy that spanned centuries, one they could no longer escape. Let's figure this out, she whispered. Before it's too late, you feel like you're walking down the street and there's a story behind every corner like just out of sight yeah well that's kind of what we're getting into today and you know what gets me What's that? it's like with all of the information we have now you'd think these stories would just fade away you know but they don't they really stick around totally it's like this weird need we have to explain the unexplainable like, <laughs> yeah exactly that shiver down your spine you just gotta know why mm. so today we're diving into a podcast script, an interview with uh, Professor Jane Doe. Oh, I've heard of her. Yeah, she wrote Mysteries of the Modern World. She's a folklore expert. And she gets into, like, the nitty-gritty of what makes these urban legends tick. And you know what's interesting? She actually argues that these stories are way more than just, like, campfire tales. Oh, yeah. They're more like social x-rays or something, you know, showing us what people are really worried about. Whoa, social x-rays. That's a good one. I like that. Yeah, and Professor Doe, she calls them modern parables. Like, they're not just about scaring you. There's actually a lesson woven in there, even if we don't realize it. Okay, now that is an interesting way to look at it. Right. So it's not just about, like, the chairs. It's about absorbing some kind of deeper meaning even subconsciously exactly and you know it's a great example she talks about the vanishing hitchhiker and how it totally blew up after world war ii like think about it tons of social change women are doing new things the open roads the symbol of freedom also like uncertainty all of these anxieties about changing roles and it's all right there in the story okay now you gotta remind me about the vanishing hitchhiker it's one of those i always hear about but the details are always fuzzy. Right, it's like a bad dream you just can't quite remember. So basically, someone's driving late at night, picks up a hitchhiker, usually a young woman, and everything seems normal at first, but then, poof, they disappear. Okay, I see where it's going. Yeah, and sometimes they even leave something behind, like a scarf or some luggage. Oh, just to make it extra creepy. But why that story, you know? What is it about the vanished hitchhiker that just gets under our skin and stays there? Well, here's where it gets really interesting. Okay, you've got me hooked. What makes The Vanishing Hitchhiker such a classic? All right, so imagine this. You're driving down this deserted road late at night, just the sound of the engine, right? And every shadow starts looking like a person. Every little noise makes you jump. That's what this story plays on, the primal fears we have. The fear of the dark, the fear of what we don't know. Okay, now you're just trying to scare me. But I get it, that fear of the unknown, it's powerful stuff. It really is. But there's more to it than just that initial scare, right? The vanishing hitchhiker sticks with you because it leaves you with all these questions. Like, was the hitchhiker even real? What happened to them? Was it, you know, something supernatural? Or even worse, something deliberate? That mystery, that lack of closure, it keeps the story alive in our heads. It's like a puzzle you can't put down, even though you know some pieces are missing. Yeah. We want those answers, even if they scare us. Exactly. And this is where Professor Doe's take on it gets super interesting. She says, these urban legends, like the vanishing hitchhiker, they aren't just about giving us goosebumps. There's often a deeper meaning, a warning, hidden within the fear. Wait, so it's not just about freaking out teenagers telling scary stories. There's actually something else going on. 
Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Think about those classic warnings we all heard growing up. We're right. Don't go to strangers. Be careful. You trust. The vanishing hitchhiker, it kind of reinforces those anxieties, don't you think? Like, it's this creepy reminder of potential dangers out there, especially for women on their own. You know, I never thought about it that way before, but it makes so much sense. These stories are almost like a way to pass down warnings, anxieties from generation to generation. And those anxieties, they often reflect what people were worried about at the time. So the vanishing hitchhiker, with hitchhiking being so common back then, it makes sense that it took off in the post-war era. People were driving more, but there were also these new anxieties about safety, especially on the open road. So if the vanishing hitchhiker reflects those mid-century anxieties, what about the urban legends we have today? That when we get frightened up now, it's really making me think. What are the modern day stories that give us chills? What do they say about us? Now that is the question, isn't it? And it's something Professor Doe really makes us think about in his podcast script. She's like, look at the stories spreading like wildfire now, the ones that really get under your skin. What do they tell us about what we're afraid of today? I feel like we could talk about this for hours. Hours, yeah, I was going to say we could make this whole series. But you're right, Professor Doe leaves us with a lot to think about. What are the stories that really get to us now? You know, now that we aren't driving around and you know, hitchhikers quite as much. Well, I mean, it's a whole digital age now, right? It makes sense that our fears have gone digital, too. Yeah, like, so we're talking like AI taking over the world. <laughs> what, what about those creepy pastas that just go viral? Yeah, those get out of my scene. Definitely. And Professor Doe even talks about that, how urban legends reflect their time period. So it's no surprise that our anxieties about technology, about misinformation, even about what's real and what's not, it's all making its way into the stories we tell. Like, remember Slender Man? Oh, wow, yeah, that one blew up online. Totally, and it really tapped into those fears, especially, I think, back in the early 2010s about the internet and its impact, especially on kids. It's true, I kind of forgot about Slender Man, but for a while there, it was everywhere. And what's so interesting is how it went beyond just a story. People were making art, videos, even trying to like track Slender Man down in real life. It's like that line between fiction and reality got really blurry. Which is kind of creepy, but also kind of cool. Totally. And that's what makes these urban legends so interesting. They change and adapt with us. They reflect our world and the things we worry about. It makes you wonder, you know, what will we be talking about in our future dick dives? What stories will be giving everyone chills a generation from now? Question. Well, listeners, it seems we're ending not with an answer, but with a challenge. Keep an ear out. What are the stories that make you stop and think, the ones that give you that little shiver? What do they say about us, about our world? What fears, anxieties, fascinations are woven in? Something to think about next time you're walking down a dark street or scrolling through your phone late at night. Who knows what's out there, lurking in the shadows. Signore e signori, abbiamo iniziato la discesa verso la nostra destinazione. Il comandante informa che da questo momento è vietato l'uso di qualsiasi dispositivo elettronico. Vi preghiamo inoltre di riporre il vostro bagaglio a mano nelle apposite cappelliere sopra di voi, in modo che l'equipaggio possa preparare la cabina per l'atterraggio. Ladies and gentlemen, we have started to send into our destination. The captain informs that from now on the use of any electronic devices is forbidden. For safe landing, please make sure that all hand luggage is securely stowed in the overhead lockers.
sia lanciate fino a quando il segnale luminoso non verrà spento. Per evitare la caduta di oggetti vi invitiamo ad usare la massima cautela nell'aprire le cappelliere. Vi ringraziamo per averci scelto e darvi appuntamento per un nuovo volo. Vi auguriamo un piacere di tutto il giorno. Arrivederci. That is in Jasmine on behalf of the crew. Welcome to our destination. We assist you if we can't ask you to remain seated with your seatbelt fastened until the front and seatbelt sign is being turned off. We suggest you to open the overhead lockers carefully. Thank you for flying with us. We wish you pleasant stay.